Okay, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, this is our fourth panel in the Southwest Reflections in Between Shadows of the Land series. And I first want to honor the Tiwa speaking peoples on whose land we stand. And my name is Michelle Lantieri. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions here at the Millicent Rogers Museum. And we're so excited to be here today with two of the nine artists in this exhibition. Um, on this side of me is Paula Lopez from Tasuki. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And over here is Will Wilson coming to us from Santa Fe today. And we're really honored to have him here too. Thank you. Um, and so a little bit about the exhibition. Um, the exhibition is the second installment in the Millicent Rogers Museum's New Mexico Artist Series. Um, and so Southwest Reflections, In Between Shadows of the Land, it offers a diverse exploration of nine New Mexico artists' portrayals of environmental relationships and the ways that these events become conveyed through shadows, reflections, and movements. And so this full list of the artists are Matthew and Julie Chase Daniel, Dora Dillisto, who's here in our audience today. Thanks for being here. And Juanita J. Lavadi, who's also here in our audience. Thank you for being here. Lorraine Gila Lewis, Colette Marie, and also Brandon Adriano Ortiz. And I'd like to thank the following organizations for their generous support of the project, New Mexico Arts, Taos Community Foundation, and also Los Alamos National Laboratory Foundation. So it's my pleasure to introduce both of these artists to you today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. Will Wilson's art centers around the continuation and transformation of customary indigenous cultural practice. He is a Diné Navajo photographer and a trans customary artist who spent his formative years living on the Navajo Nation. Wilson studied photography, sculpture, and art history at the University of New Mexico. And at Oberlin College, he studied studio art and art history. In 2007, Wilson won the Native American Fine Art Fellowship from the Idle Dork Museum. In 2010, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award for Sculpture. And in 2016, the Paulette Krasner Foundation grant for photography. In 2020, Wilson was the Duran artist in residence at the Yale University Art Gallery. He's held visiting visitor, he's held visiting, uh, for, for, sorry, this is a tough one, I don't say it too much. Um, <laughs> Wilson has held visiting professorships at the Institute of American Indian Arts, Oberlin College, and the University of Arizona. In 2017, he received the New Mexico Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts, and he's currently the program head of photography at Santa Fe Community College. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Um, Paula Lopez is a Chicano artist, and she discovered the power of color while in the third grade. Then <laughs> um, she went from there, and during the Chicano movement while she was in high school, the Brown Berets took over and painted cultural murals at her school in the courtyard. She saw how the power of their work both educated and influenced people. Lopez's paintings are in many permanent collections. In New Mexico, these include the National Hispanic Cultural Center, the State Capital Art Collection, El Museo Cultural, the Harwood Museum of Art, and also here at the Millicent Rogers Museum. In 2005, her work was presented in the White House as the official portrait artist of the New Mexico People's Holiday Tree. And in 2009, she was honored by Bowling Green State University as the keynote speaker at the 16th Annual Latino Issues Conference. In 2011, her work was featured in the prestigious exhibition Adelante, Mexican American Artists, 1960s and Beyond at the Forest Lawn Museum in Glendale, California. Lopez is currently based in Tsuki, and she continues to draw inspiration from her father's early encouragement of her work as an artist. Welcome, Paula. Thank you. Um, so we've got some different slides um, that both artists have brought in for us to learn a lot more about their practice and their work. Um, and so what I think we'll do is just kind of mention some of the discussion questions that the three of us uh, talked about, and then each artist will go through their work and tell us more um, in detail. 
And then we'll kind of come back together and ask for questions from you all and look at some of Pola and Will's works side by side. Um, so some of the questions that uh, we talked about, you know, for this program today, um, things like how long have you been making art? Um, if we can learn more about your background as an artist, main influences, guiding forces, um, and then some of the concepts of reflection and regeneration and how that's been changing. Um, and then also some of the concepts of reflecting land um, in terms of culture, environment, and exchange, and also relationships between light, shadow, and healing. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to be hearing about as each artist moves through their slides. Um, and so, Paula, would you like to start and go through your work first? All right, here we go. Look, look. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're, can you hear me? It sounds good. Um, this is the title of my slideshow. It's called Anatomy of a Mestiza Chicana's Voice. Mestiza, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a person of mixed heritage. So I've got Native American, European blend with others. <laughs> So, but the majority are uh, Native American indigenous. Um, but I do have a big mouth, so I always add that Chicana voice in there. So this first slide is self-portrait of me as a retail artist and me as a child artist. Uh, the little, it's called Inner Screen. <laughs> and the little girl is me with my little um, red smock and my little red beret, because I this was me in kindergarten. I used to read third grade level when I started school in kindergarten, that's preschool. And um, because my mother, I was the first child and she taught me how to read really quickly. So my teacher said, let's put her in the third grade. And she said, no, leave her here. So then she would put me in the corner to paint little memory graph sheets. My mother thought it was real cute. So she bought me a red smock, like a little artiste and everything. So I, one day I was in this smock with my little red beret and my teacher gave me a mimeograph sheet that was before digital and all that. It said, I'm a bluebird, paint me blue. Well, red being my color, I'm married, so I was all in red. I said, I'm gonna paint this bird red. And I mixed, I had the red tempera, and this was a pivotal time in me discovering color, because before I knew it, I had taken the red paint, painted the table, painted the floor, painted my thing, painted everything. I, would, I got absorbed in the red. I could hear the red, I could feel the red, the vibration of the color, and I got lost in it. The next thing I know is I look up and I see the teacher going, her mouth is moving. I don't know what she was saying. And that was that moment when she said, you'll never paint again. And that's when I went, what? You know, so she snapped me out of it, but um, she did never let me paint again because I made a mess. And so she'd make me sit in the corner instead and look out the windows. And so I started to explore color. I thought, well, if that's what red feels like and sounds like, then what does blue feel like? And I started to look at stare at things and start to explore it. And she later came back in years to apologize for doing that to me. She thought she had damaged me, but in actuality, I thanked her because she did me a favor because then I was able to sit with it what I had discovered about color. And um, at that point, I realized that I could hear color. I didn't know that color had a sound before that. And, and I thought that was normal. I found out later in years that it's a condition called synthesia or something. But that's that's why I say I'm a colorist first and the subject matter is secondary. Subject matter very important to me because I feel like it should tell a story. It should mean, be meaningful. Um, but the color has to be first always. So, okay, that's the first slide. Next slide. Oops, wait. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so um, this was my first tree out of high, my first painting out of high school, the one on the left, Tree Hugger, 1972. I was a senior in high school, and that's when my father acquired the land that we have that was burned down, that I made these paintings about, by burning the Hermit's Peak fire. So it's been 50 years. This was my first painting. This is my last painting to date. Um, I became an artist because, like Michelle said, the Brown Berets took over my high school that year in 1972. This was West Las Vegas in Old Town Las Vegas, New Mexico. And um, I didn't know, we were very kind of segregated. 
and I didn't know what a Chicano was, and the brown birds took over our school, flew the Mexican flag over the American flag, upside down, and slept in our gym. They wow. took over Highlands University as well, and I heard they were painting murals in the courtyard, so the school board said, don't come to school, the terrorists are taking us over, <laughs> the radical people. And so, of course, I went to see what was going on, because I always liked art, but we didn't have an art curriculum in my school. So I went and I saw the images, the very powerful images of farm workers and pyramids in Mexico and the eagle of the, you know, all kinds of danzantes and all kinds of images I've never been exposed to and it opened my eyes. And it was an education to me. I saw the power of art and I said, that's what I need to do. So right out of high school, I became an artist. And um, that's, that was one of my first paintings, was that tree at the ranch. It was when my father bought that tree, this tree used to tower over where we had the Forest Service come out and measure, it was 400 years old. And it just stood out and it was a grandfather tree. And it was, you know, so I was very inspired by it. And the little woman hugging it, that's me. <laughs> and so the second one is the Anima Sola, the lost soul who's in purgatory. And during the fire, that's how I felt. I felt like I was burning up with the lamp and the trees because I could feel it. I could hear the screams of the trees. And so I'm holding that grandfather tree and I'm uh, detaching because I was forced to detach from the land and from the trees because I had always been a conservator. I had always protected the trees and the animals. I never let anybody cut the trees, you know. I would talk to all the trees basically, <laughs> like they were friends, you know. So um, that was me cradling it, saying goodbye, um, coming full circle with the land. Next slide, please. Okay, so right during, um, after high school, I, my father gave me an old building on the plaza in Las Vegas, West Las Vegas, now where the plaza town is, it's a historical place. Uh, and he said, if you fix it up, I'll let you become an artist, you, you can use it, I'll let you use it, you can go figure out how to be an artist. So I, um, because I didn't go to college and self-taught. And I um, was doing my little artwork there in that little studio. We fixed up this building and I was, I started to sell art supplies in order to buy, be able to buy them. So I would, I started a little stock of art supplies to sell to the university so I could have materials. And then I would be painting in that room, at that place as well. So one day the club, these, these three artists from Santa Fe, Fred V. Hill, Liberto Miera, and Luis Tapia were doing a Cinco de Mayo show at Highlands University and they drove by the studio and they saw me and they came in and they gave me a, a card and they said, you're a woman painter? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, you're not part of the Cofradia. And I'm like, what's the Cofradia? And it was an arts organization and they actually had cards. So I became a card carrying member of La Cofradia de Arte the artesano Tifanicos and Nuevo Mexico, the Rio Grande. So for like 10 years, um, we participated in art shows and Juanita did as well. That's where we grew and we, we learned about our culture and our identities. We had shows in all our communities, we did community shows and we opened doors for us um, as artists because the reason they formed was because they couldn't show their work in the traditional Spanish market and they were contemporary artists. So we just did it for ourselves. And we eventually had a show at the Fine Arts Museum in Santa Fe. Uh, Gene Autry flew us to California to have a show in his museum. And so we we just had a great time. And we had a show here, <laughs> several shows here. Here be Vicente Martinez, who was then a, a director of, or a curator, I don't know what his exact title was, but um, so that was my period when I made this painting, you know, searching for my identity at that point. I'm a young woman artist painting stuff, and with this group, discovering all kinds of things that I hadn't known about my background. Because up to that point, they told us we were puros españoles. It turns out I have 4% Spanish blood. I did my DNA test, just to make sure. And so this is a tic-tac-toe painting that the museum actually owns in their acquisition here and in the collection. Mm -hmm. And it's a tic-tac-toe game about identity. And each square, there's a label that I had been called. You know, there's the Mexican-American, the Chicano, the Spanish-American, the Latino, 
the Indo Hispano Chica Ninja, which I like, I like Chica Ninja. Um, then there's all the there's the Hispanic and all the minority other subtitles that they call us, and then the mestizo is in the center. So at that point, I had decided I would call myself a mestizo. Now it's kind of a term that people don't like so much. I don't know why, but that's part of the caste system that we grew up with. And the title of this is Who Wins This Game? Who Wins This Game of Identity? Um, and my son actually told me that the circles and the X's come to the same corner square. That's why he told me, who wins this game, mom? And he gave me the title to the painting. And, and the answer is, where the census says, where it's approved Hispanic, it says, identify yourself. And that's where you win, when you identify yourself and you own who you are. It doesn't matter which one of these you choose, which label, you know, they're all labels, but I don't use the lines of the TikTok game to separate me from other cultures. I use them to bridge to other cultures. So I can, I, was, you know, I can relate to any of these. Any day I can be a Latina. Also, also. And even I can be Mexicana and cry with the mariachis, and I can be native, indigenous. You know, at, at ceremony, I can be all of these. And I think it's really fortunate to be able to have that as a background. So that was a Cofradia painting. Next slide, please. Um, the next painting is also a Cofradia painting. Once I discovered, I went through all my identity crisis. <laughs> I discovered I had everything in me. I realized that we're all one people. We're all one people. And so this is the Mother Earth. We're all one people. We're all indigenous to this planet. And um, we should realize that. And we should love each other and take care of each other and take care of the earth, especially, you know. So this is a very large painting. It's also, this is in the Capital Art Collection at the Roundhouse. I think it sits in front of the state representative's doorway. So they get to see it every time they go there. I don't know if they've moved it, but it should be there. I'm gonna go check. <laughs> but as a reminder to them, you know. Okay, um, next slide. This is another uh, painting I did with when I was involved with the Cofradia. I was very radical, you know, developing my voice. And this is a feminist painting because I'm also sort of a feminist. Uh, and um, it's called Huequil Vestido de Mujer. So it's a wipil that when a garment that women wear, but in each one of the squares of the blouse or the wipil are different faces, mascaras, masks that we wear as people, right? So there's la llorona, where sometimes we're crybabies. Uh, la virgen, sometimes we act like we're virgins, you know, we're so high as we're so good. And then la reina, we're princesses, we're queens, you know, we rule. Um, la loca. That's me every day. La loca. Um, la angel, where we're innocent and sweet. We do nothing but good. Under her is la puta. And we, do I have to explain that one? <laughs> la malcriada. La malcriada means the bad girl, being raised badly. I've been called malcriada. And in fact, I've been in several shows called Las Malcriadas. Um, we break all the rules. And then at the bottom is la bruja slash curandera. So you can't be one without the other. You have to know both sides of the medicine, right? And then the center is la super diosa, superwoman, the goddess. So all of these make the goddess who we are. And at the bottom it says, I'm la mama, I'm the hija, I'm the prima, I'm the tia. I cook, I clean, I save money for your emergencies. <laughs> You know, I love you and I'm always there. So that's what the, the women's voice in this painting, you know, and everything. So that was the copy of the other. Okay. I'm trying to go to these real quick because I know we see <laughs> Okay, so I used to paint a lot of corn. I guess the indigenous side of me is I love corn. I can paint it in my sleep. I, there's a corn painting back there on that wall. And I just love corn. Corn is sacred. Uh, the Mayans believe we're made of corn, mud, and the menstrual blood of first mother. And indigenous cultures all believe corn is sacred. It nurtures us. It's our, you know, it feeds our soul. It's very sacred. So I've always painted corn. I've painted with my eyes closed. 
it just comes out. And um, this is a corn painting I did here during my New Mexico days. Nueve Lopez, nine years of corn. Nine is a, a number, a significant number in numerology. And it had to be nine. It kept telling me there has to be nine. So there's nine. And then this one, City Corn, is a painting I made after I moved to California. And I, when I moved to California, I said, okay, I'm not painting no more corn. I'm in the city. I'm a city artist. <laughs> and my studio was across from a park that they planted 30 some, 33 acres of corn. And guess where the corn came from? Let's see. It was holy corn from New Mexico. And it was an art project called Not a Cornfield. And this big famous artist planted this corn one summer and, and fed it. It was so tall and nurtured it. And there are all kinds of events. And that's the corn that came out of that cornfield. So it followed me to LA. And that's downtown LA in the background. And it was not a cornfield. And really, everybody did notice it was a cornfield in the middle of LA. It was, it was weird. She was trying to connect people back to the earth, right? Um, next slide, please. So Tree of Hope, this is the tree that I painted for when I represented New Mexico as the official portrait artist of the tree that went to Washington, D.C. Um, that's the government for you. They have an official portrait to paint the tree that goes up there to be, be on the White House lawn. And that year, New Mexico got selected. We hadn't been selected in a long time because the tree has to go all the way across to Washington, you know, so they picked, uh, they had a competition and um, there were 12 artists and we all, it was people's choice. And this was my tree of hope. There was luminarias around the tree with doves and um, I won. So I got to go with the tree to Washington and represent um, New Mexico. It's, it, Bush was the president then. And they were warning me, don't say anything to <laughs> Just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so um, I was good, and it was a beautiful experience. And it was really nice. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, after I, um, the Cofre de Dia shut down, I moved to Santa Fe, and I was just doing my own thing. And then 9 11 came. And a curator from California was on vacation in Santa Fe, and I had a studio downtown Santa Fe. And I was trying to think of closing because after 9-11, everything went down, downtown Santa Fe. So I was sitting there, and a cur this curator that was on vacation from California came into my studio, and he said, oh, Chicana art. Where else can I see it? I said, this is pretty much you, I guess. Not downtown Santa Fe. So he said, well, I'm curating an exhibit, and I want you to come to California and be in this exhibit. You come and stay with me and my wife. We'll put you up and bring all these paintings. And I said, okay, I'll go. It sounded exciting. And so I went, and I fell in love in, with California, and I met all the top dog Chicano artists, all the ones you see in books. And I came home, got my stuff, and went back. I moved to California. I was look, I went looking for the Chicano art movement there because I had had the experience of the Hispano, Indio identity here. And so now I wanted to find my Chicano community. And Count LA is the place to do it. So I went there and I was there for 16 years. These are the paintings I did there. So you can see how the environment affected me. I was influenced by the culture there, mostly Mexicano, um, a lot of. Um, the Loteria Pinup Girl, that's a feminist painting. She's got Loteria cards on her body, but they're not traditional Loteria cards. If you look closely, I made them up. And it's about like a bad breakup. And so there's like all kinds of crazy things on there. <laughs> you have to look at it closely. And it's the woman being empowered after a breakup and that experience. And the thing she's sitting on is an old Aztec, uh, like a a pedestal that they have the Aztec god of beauty and flowers, Xochitlili, sitting on. She's kicked him off and she's taken over the throne. So she's taken her place. <laughs> and um, the background is from a traditional Aztec police, police, an Aztec book. So it's a traditional background. Um, the second one, Coyoshaki y la Chola, was. Uh, in an exhibit in Albuquerque at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. 
And it was a Chona exhibit. And being in LA, oh, I know everything about Cholas. Now. <laughs> I was embedded with the Cholas. And so I was excited to be in that show. And Koyo Shaki is the Earth Mother. She's the one that represents Guadalupe from that scene. This is the Aztec Earth Mother. This is what they, the Spaniards were afraid, who they were afraid of when they were conquering the native people because she was so scary. And they buried her. And when they discovered her, they were, they were doing some work in Mexico City, um, like in the 50s or 60s, and they uncovered her. They were so scared they covered her back. But they eventually unearthed her, and, and she represents the Earth Mother. She's got two snakes for heads, claws, feet, clawed hands. Um, and she represents, she has a serpent skirt, a skirt made of a serpent. She's very intense. Uh, but she represents, they replaced her with Vita de Guadalupe. And that's how the natives were con converted to Catholicism. I mean, the genocide ended because now they were conformed, right? So the Cholas are like her. They're fierce. And you don't want to mess with them. <laughs> and they got the nails and they're just intense. I love them. They're beautiful. Okay, next slide. These are other um, Mexicano, Chicano influence paintings I did uh, in California. El Gallo, my dream mariachi. El Gallo, when I mad at things, he's a Gallo on the, you know, he's the best rooster on, on the ground. Uh, the mariachis are like that, you know, and they're so beautiful, the mariachis. That's my dream mariachi. And then La Quinceañera. That's a tradition how uh, a rite of passage for young girls when they turn 15 in Mexican households. Not so much in New Mexico. So these were really things I didn't really experience in New Mexico because we we're more Spanish than we were Mexicano, right? So um, I got exposure to all that culture up there. And that's why these paintings reflect that. Next slide, please. Okay, another thing, Day of the Dead, that we never really did much here. Although now, I know Santa Fe just had a Day of the Dead festival, which was the first time ever. And they're like, oh, wow. You know, and California is all over the place. It's a Mexican culture. And I learned a lot about it. And every time Day of the Dead would come around, I'd have to make a painting. So I've got like 40 or 50 Day of the Dead paintings. But these are two that I share today because um, the first one is La Sexy La Flaca. And I challenge you to decide which one is which. <laughs> and they're on the red carpet. And it's about how Hollywood wants women to be skinny and to have a certain image about themselves to be beautiful. And so, yeah, you can be that beautiful, but you'll start to death or you'll die or something will happen to you. You'll kill yourself, your inner self. You're trying to be so beautiful superficially. Um, and the Valhosa Gallery is behind them, all the skulls with their, their, what, their saliva. <laughs> their Valhosa Gallery. The people who speak Spanish here know what I'm talking about. Valhosa are, are uh, saliva, you know, like when a dog wants meat and the saliva. <laughs> so that's them behind the, the sexy La Placa. And then the next one is Mi Padre. Uh, this is a tribute to my father because Dad the Dad is to honor a loved one that's passed. And this is a portrait of him in the actor world. Um, he was a pachuco and a, not a zoot suitor, but he just liked to dress fine and lay back like that. And he was always real concerned about his appearance. He thought he was beautiful, handsome. And so he would always well, you know, dressed and well taken care of. And uh, he liked old cars. Uh, he was a boxer at one point, which for him, he won all his fights by knockout because he didn't want nobody to mess up his beautiful face. <laughs> so he just go out and knock him out, and that was it, you know? 30 fights by knockout. So wow. uh, and then he was a gambler. So the cards that represent, he always had the winning hand. Everything he did, he won. He was a Leo. And the world revolved around him. And he, everything he did, he was successful. You know, but he also said, he had an angel on one side and a devil on one side. So it wasn't like he was just a really good guy. He also had some tendencies to do stuff. But, uh, but that's a tribute to my father. And next slide, please. 
Uh, let them. So this is a painting I made in California that people love this painting. I don't know why they really accepted this painting. It's the braid. La Trenza means the braid. And the braid signifies to a lot of people strength, uh, to Native people. It, it's a powerful symbol of uh, the connection to creator. It's your antenna. It's how you feel things. It, it's it, you don't cut your hair, you know, unless you have a special reason. Or, and so wearing trenzas is a sense of pride and a sense of spirituality to, to, this, cult, to this culture. I just wanted to jump in and say that this was the painting how I found out about you. <laughs> yeah, this was the one. This is my introduction to your work. And um, it's kind of stuck with me uh, just working with you on this project and the new paintings that you've been working on. All right, see how it connects me. <laughs> And the, the next slide. Okay, this one, another feminist painting um, I did in LA called um, Wall of Ar Archetypes, Know Thyself. Up there it says, No Sket Ipsum, it means Know Thyself. So in each Nietzsche, there's one type of woman, almost like the weeping painting. There is Ugly Betty, which is everybody's friend. She does the right thing. <laughs> And then in the center is El Sexo Fuerte, you know, the Mexican movie star. You can't resist the Mexicana. And then there's Santa Librada, who was crucified. Santa Librada. Librada means the free one. So she was the one of the women saints that was crucified for not conforming to marrying somebody she didn't want to marry herself. Anyway, so um, yeah, so it's like, know yourself as a woman. Who are you? Where do you fit? Are you all of these? Or are you just one? Or... Yeah. Next slide. Okay, so I started off with the video in the Guadalupe Alaban people. And here we are in California. She appears everywhere. <laughs> She's everywhere. So I was painting just a simple agave cactus, and she appeared. So that's my apparition of this video in the Guadalupe in California. Uh, this is the last slide. It's a, it's a, it's a recent painting I did here in uh, New Mexico. Um, and it's called the Blue Raven. The Raven is my totem. And he's blue for a reason. And um, there's two flaming arrows. And that's because of the confusion that's going on. Things are out of balance. And normally, um, Raven brings our prayers to creator, he can traverse the dimensions and he brings creator's messages to us. So right now he's in a period that's very cold and there's a lot of confusion and stuff going on. So um, like a war like going on inside. So that's, that was it for that. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, that was a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for a lot of that. You know, keep a lot of those details either. Um, and then I also wanted to share that um, Will and I worked on a panel uh, back in 2018 at the College Art Association, um, and that panel was titled something along the lines of um, Indigenous Artists on the International Art Stage. Um, and so really excited that you could be part of the show and um, following your work, you know, from you going from the autoimmune response series and like continuing on with um, connecting the dots. So um, thank you for being here today. Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, I'll talk about the work. Um, I'll try and be brief so we can have a discussion. Um, I do like to start slideshows off lately with this image just because it, it, it I think, speaks to of how much change and transformation has occurred in such a, a short amount of time. Um, this image, actually, uh, my mom told me to seek it out, and, and I found it. The, the little girl in the foreground is my mother. Um, and, you know, I don't know, it's just remarkable to me to look at that image and think that's how life was, you know, for these folks back in the day. Um, and, you know, it's this kind of moment uh, they were on their way to the Tuba City Trading Post from uh, their summer sheep camp. They were well provisioned. They wouldn't have stopped at that kind of roadside water to, to gather um, stuff, you know. Uh, but they met this man, uh, Ray Manley, who was an editorial photographer in the basement in Tucson. 
any of this vision, you know, of course, um, and and this is the resulting image. I mean, I I love that he made it for other reasons, obviously, but um, it's just remarkable to me that, that that transformation has occurred, and you know, really one generation. Um, if we think about generation, just kind of extended uh, time based on people. Um, anywho, uh, next next slide, please. Um, I I started this series back in 2004, actually, uh, entitled Autoimmune Response, where I'm kind of imagining, you know, this this uh, sort of mystery time uh, traveling person, um, this post-apocalyptic Diné man trying to figure out what's been going on. Uh, you can kind of see it, but on the left side, I, I took. Uh, one of the Nevada test site images and, and dropped in a, a nuclear explosion there. And, you know, it's kind of the, the harbinger of things to come. Um, and the series follows this, this person's, this protagonist's uh, um, travels through the, the landscape trying to figure out how to, how to survive and, and trying to figure out what went on. Uh, so next slide. Um, so, you know, um, the, the narrative continues. He travels through these spaces that are, you know, pretty beautiful, and um, I guess there's there's investigation of why they've become toxic and how how he's trying to figure out how to how to navigate them. Uh, next slide. Um, so in, in the series, um, you know, I, I'm drawing from I think. Uh, the, the Navajo or Diné creation story, um, that there are these hero twins born of water and monster slayer who, who rid the world of monsters and, and make this world kind of in, inhabitable for, for us, like the five-fingered folk. Um, and uh, I was also thinking about, you know, kind of issues uh, that are occurring on Navajo, like you know, the problem with uranium, um, how it's such a pervasive kind of toxin. Um, as a as a metaphor, uh, metaphorical monster, I suppose. So you know, uh, that's that's what was hopefully being inferred in this work. Um, next slide, please. Um, so. Uh, Michelle asked about like transitions and, and, and different bodies of work, and one thing that I was thinking about was how that more imaginary kind of, you know, thinking about kind of my own relation to this place and looking through um, actually hinges on, you know, some real things. Uh, and more more recently, I've been exploring kind of the history of uh, uranium extraction and processing in the Navajo Nation, and how that legacy has, you know, created this really toxic environment. Unfortunately, this is a map um, that was developed by the EPA and the Navajo Nation EPA of uh, you know over 520 um, abandoned uranium mines on on the Navajo Nation. So between the 40s and um, the mid eighties, um, the Navajo nation suites supplied like over half of, of, you know, of all of uranium that was being used to kind of develop the, well, initially the, the, the first nuclear weapon, right. And then, uh, during the cold war, the, um, the, the nuclear arsenal, um, and then also for, for energy, right. Um, and I think until 1971, the Atomic Energy Commission was the sole uh, purchaser of this substance in the United States, right? Um, and they were doing it through these kind of front corporations, but um, they didn't um, tell people that how, how dangerous it was and how toxic it was to work in these mines and bring this material home. Um, and of course, the half-life of uranium is billions of years, right? So this problem's not going away anytime soon. Um, so we're, we're, we're stuck with it. Uh, and, and that's what some of these images are that you see on the, on the walls, right? So, um, you go to the next slide. Um, uh, a few years ago, I think 2019, pretty much I started, you know, uh, I teach photography and my students started showing up with these amazing images, you know, and I was like, 
how are they how are they making these pictures? Um, I mean, you have an airplane or a helicopter, <laughs> you know, of course, it was like the the drone kind of revolution type. So um it's just un um you know unleash this uh amazing like new way to see the world uh which is particularly useful i think you know in, in the classic american landscape space right so you know, it's really hard to understand like what's in front of you you see this beautiful vista um but you know like this is the uranium disposal cell on the site of a former uranium mill four miles outside of the city arizona where i grew up it's a super fun site now um but from the road you can't really see it you know but if you send a drone up uh, you know a camera on a robot basically um you know 400 500 feet you can you can image it and start to kind of understand it in a different way right um, so I'm totally fascinated with this and kind of started to document all of these different sites on, on the Navajo Nation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and we can just run through a few of these because um, they're they're very similar, uh, just in, in idea, right? So these are all um, different uranium mines or mills um, or just um, sites where where processing was occurring this is a particularly um kind of i guess visually interesting one it's it's in mexican hat utah um and, and actually that view is the same as that uh photograph over there and, and you can on the horizon you can better understand like that monument valley is right there right so this iconic western kind of landscape just over the hill <laughs> There was a uranium processing mill uh, that was built, I think, in '56 and, and ran until, um, well, it was used in different uh, forms until the '80s, uh, and then you know the EPA and the Nation mm -hmm. set out to um, turn it into this uranium disposal cell. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm doing this project right now with uh, Diné College, um, which is the tribal college on the Navajo Nation. Um, and, you know, we've got this two year kind of starter grant to do uh, photography uh, workshops with the students. Um, there's a speaker series um, and, and we're titling that series reframing indigenous remediation and, and the notion is to, to bring different voices to the table to, to think about this issue in, in different ways right. Um, I mean, as the artists are really good at imagining different perspectives of, of possible solutions, right, for, for complex ideas of, uh, and problems, this being an important one. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, this is an interesting monument that, that is actually situated, you can see the little drone shadow, it's actually in the center of that crazy, like, you know, 15 acre yield of remediation um it's this plaque kind of to the it says that there's four million four hundred thousand tons of radioactive material interred underneath this this you know disposal cell um and it talks about the radioactivity you know mining valley uh that region there were a lot of mines in that region that were super productive um that's why there was a mill there um and when they did the cleanup or they, they're still doing it, it's, it's very much ongoing. Um, they brought all of the material from the region's mines to this site where the mill was and they buried everything there. Um, uh, next slide. So this is at Shiprock. There was a mill at Shiprock. There's the kind of iconic, you know, um, I don't know, I, I think as a, as a photographer, as someone who teaches, you know, landscape photography. I'm I'm hoping to you know maybe to have different perspectives on what that might mean, you know, um, and and what those those stories tell. You know, water is incredibly important. Of course, we're all very much aware of that uh, here. And these sites happen to be you know in in really 
bad places uh, in terms of you know the, the potential for contamination, right? Um, they're trying to figure out what to do with this, but they're just, you know, they're like, this is such an incredibly you know big problem that it's hard to think about how how, how much resource it will take to, to fix this. Um, so uh yeah. <laughs> That's that's the project right now. Um, and, and Will, can I ask, what is that should foreground? Is that a river? Yeah, that's the San Juan River. Uh, yeah. And that's Shiprock. I mean, if you've ever been to the Navajo Nation Fair at Shiprock, it's like those, those empty areas right behind it. But that's the town of Shiprock. Um, I have a question too. Um, sure. So these areas that have been remediated, um, that with these different layers of kinds of gravel, um, how does that work in terms of weight and shifting? <laughs> I'm just curious if you had, if you had insights on that. Yeah, I mean this isn't lined underneath, so I think they're really worried about. I think there is like a substantial clay body underneath that, but you know, eventually that's going to break down or there's going to be seepage and, you know, people are worried about, you know, the river, the aquifer. Um, that's why a lot of these have ponds next to them because they did put some plumbing down, even though they're not lined. And the idea is that some of that um, water and, you know, the, the contaminant gets pumped out, evaporated, um, and then collected from these evaporation ponds. Um, but then it's like, what do you do with that? Uh, we just had a speaker, it hasn't up yet on the on the thing, but her name is Leona Morgan, and she's she's been an you know an activist around these issues. She's a citizen of the Navajo Nation. And she's, you know, uh, kind of spearheaded this fight against the Holtec facility, which is this temporary um kind of waste storage site that they're proposing for all of nuclear waste in the United States, uh, most of it coming from nuclear power plants. Of course, there is only one nuclear power plant like close to us in the Southwest, and that's in uh, Southwest Arizona. Um, you know, all of this material is, is potentially going to end up in, um, in Southeast uh, New Mexico. Um, and so, you know, I, <laughs> we don't want to be the, the nuclear dumping ground for, for the United States. Um, I mean, you know, there's it's complicated, of course, because a lot of people are thinking about nuclear as a, as a potential kind of carbon-free solution, right, to save us from, um, you know, that component of climate change. But, you know, and I, I, I don't know if that's not necessarily not the answer uh but you know thing people have to be like aware of this history first <laughs> you know and and like fix this first before you know we decide to embark on this like you know nuclear mission that's where we're going um i don't know anyway um i mean that's that's essentially what what my work is focused on in this exhibition Thank you so much. I appreciate all your insights. And um, definitely, I was actually noticing the book that you have here to the invention of the American desert. And um, yeah, I think that is also a really central thread throughout this exhibition, too, is these relationships with um, these different kinds of desert throughout New Mexico. Um, and that was kind of one of the one of the concepts was, you know, how do we look at these direct relationships in a lot of different facets and like, you know, where are the intersections? Um, and so I think with that, um, if we could go to the next slide. Oh, here's something. Oh, um, I don't know how many more there are. Okay. <laughs> there's eight. eight. Um, did you, do you want to just run through that or just so we can hear well, it? Can I can end on this one. Okay. Um, um, this kind of cycles back to the first story, right? So I'm still doing that kind of imaginative kind of, I don't know, speculative work or something that's, that's a little more about, um, you know, an imaginary as a way to kind of process this stuff, I suppose. Um, and um, yeah, maybe we could um, just scoot ahead. There's um, there's a slide that has uh, Paula and Will's work together. Um, maybe it's maybe it's seven slides up. 
Um, <laughs> oh, wait, okay. it goes down. This one? Um, yeah, so I wanted to kind of open it up to a, a discussion um, and just ask about reflection and regeneration. I had I heard these two images together, um, you know, just thinking about the transition of these sites, just thinking about how much change has happened at these different locations. Um, uh, do you want to speak to regeneration and reflection um, in the River Ash painting? Um, I don't know about regeneration. <laughs> the reflection is there was once a forest there, and this is what's reflected back now. It's nothing but ash. We have such a severe burn that 99% of our trees are gone. And there was ash literally everywhere, everywhere. Nothing was there, nothing was left. The rocks were burned, so everything. Rocks were crumbling. I've never seen rocks crumble from heat. And the, the trees were burned through the roots. The trees that were once there were now gone. There were just holes in the ground full of ash where the tree once was. And I saw this arroyo, it's, it wasn't a river of ash, it was an arroyo full of ash. And it reminded me, it, they were like rivers of ash everywhere, just accumulated. Since then, it now has changed because of the, the flooding and the rains that came, because now they all washed down into the, the bottom of our property where the road river is. <laughs> and now that's all full of salt and ash. But um, I don't know about regeneration. That's going to take hundreds of years. That's a big problem right now. What I, the way I'm looking at it is more of evolution and how can we evolve out of this into a better place and, and, and deal with what has transpired. And it was deliberate, which is a sad part. This was an accident. It was a prescribed accident. That's an error. But they've not found out it was a deliberate act. So, and we won't go into that because I'm sure that we can get real controversial here, you and I. But we're not. <laughs> and then, Will, um, I know that part of the work that you're doing with connecting the dots also focuses on the healing aspect of it through indigenous ways. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a a really succinct answer to that. Uh, I, I I think that you know there are healing ways and, and practices that are ongoing. Um, I think it's you know at this point it's just like trying to get different viewpoints uh, and to privilege those viewpoints in a way that you know inspires action, I guess, and, and activity around this. Um, but you know, I, one one thing that we were definitely talking about is like, how can you think about remediation to include like, you know, uh, customary like understandings of the land, right? And have medicine people go out there and you know prey on the land or do whatever you know they think appropriate, you know, with their understanding of you know uh, kind of the world is is you know, a living being and that we're absolutely dependent on. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, maybe it's about asking for forgiveness or something. I don't know, you know, um, and, and uh, but making that part of policy too, I think. I mean, I think some people, have, and I think the EPA even to some extent has kind of decided that some of the resources that are going towards this remediation need to go in those directions. Um, I mean, I'm certainly not the expert on that. I'm just, you know, trying to kind of create space for, for a discussion about that. And hopefully somebody else will come in and, and be like, all right, yeah, this absolutely, you know, this ceremony has to be done now <laughs> here. You know, we're going to be able to move forward in a in a way that, like, um, <clears throat> respects the, the people who live here and who are dealing with this issue. Um, but... Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, and then we'll open the floor to questions here in just a few minutes. Um, and so uh, you both talked about these different works. Um, kind of just bringing it back to the concept of the exhibition, I was wondering if you both could talk about how light and shadow factor in in terms of the different levels of that in your work. 
Okay, well, would you like to start? <laughs> um, light and shadow. I mean, as a photography uh, person, um, you know, light and shadow is, is uh, pivotal uh, in, in what I do. Um, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about the drone kind of unlocking this capacity to, you know, see in a different way. Um, so I, I guess um trying to represent this in in a way that that will catch people's you know eye and and, and bring them to to want to learn more about um what's going on is is one way that i think light and shadow become important um you know that's how we bear witness right um Okay, thank you for that time. I have to compose myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't want to cry because this painting is uh, gets me right here. And when I talk about light, on one hand, I talk about shadow. On the other hand, the land had a lot of light before. It was the trees were full of light and energy. And when I told you that I see and I and I actually hear color. It was like a symphony when I went there and the light, the vibration, the light was so high that it would just, it would make you breathe and you would just go into a Zen state. It was so spiritual up there. That was light. That was pure light from the energy of those trees. Now I go there and it's shadow because it's all gone. And I don't, the vibration is low. The frequency is low. The, there's no, the color is like a low hum, like, you know, it's it's not a high elevated sound that comes to light. It's a very low kind of a painful crying, you know, like a moaning. And it's very difficult to be there because I hear that because even though a lot of the trees are gone, the few that survive are still suffering from the loss. They're suffering. The earth is suffering. So when we talk about healing, I, I, it, it doesn't feel the same anymore there. So I walk through the land and my daughter and I, we cry and we give our tears to the earth. And we know that walking and being our presence, being there, giving our energy to the land will help heal what was, what's there. And, and, and we're, we surrender to it because we were very attached to that beauty. And we've detached and we're, allow, we're allowing ourselves to accept what new regeneration is coming. And whatever comes new, whatever creator wants to bring us new, we will honor it, we'll, we'll, we'll walk with it. We're not going to abandon it. But it's a very difficult situation to be there and witness it. You know, um, it's really hard. And, and this painting also represents like the Virgen de Guadalupe, like the Mother Earth. So not only does it represent my personal painting, it also represents the burning of the, of the Mother Earth like what they're doing with the uranium, what they're, what they're trying to do with bringing us higher level waste, nuclear waste to New Mexico, the fracking, all this stuff that they're doing to our beautiful state, you know? When I was in high school, we were we were fighting the low level waste isolation pilot projects. We we're like, don't let New Mexico go to waste. They've had accidents, it's it's gone kaput, and now they're gonna bring high level waste. This all just disturbs me, you know? And, Part of the message is that we have to start honoring Earth. We need to get people who are in charge to stop doing stuff like this. They got to stop burning our forests so that they can frack and displace people. They got to stop mining the uranium for weapons. What's up? What What is the point? And if we as artists can't do that and and bring that to your attention and bring it to the attention of the world, then who's going to do it? Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> oh, I would just mention that, like, uh, Governor um, Michelle Lujan Richards is against the whole type thing. So, <laughs> if you don't want it to be <laughs> uh, instituted, vote for her. <laughs> and can we go to the next slide? Just have a different image while we, while we talk some more. Um, what questions do you all have in the audience? Does anyone have? You too. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Great. Okay. Well, so, do you see any regeneration at all, and on, on a very small level, after falling the rains? I'm just curious. Yes, I go up there quite often, and I've been documenting 
deliberately the change of the line. It's been going through many phases, many changes. And yes, first it was all black and gray, and then a little bit of green started coming up. And last time I was there, there were all these invasive, beautiful red weeds. We had never seen that. There were weeds, but they're gorgeous, you know, and, and just the black against the crimson. And it was so I'm honoring whatever it is. But yes, it's the forest is powerful and it will regenerate. And I don't know what it's going to how it's going to end or how it's going to evolve. I just know I won't see the trees the way I grew up with them again in my lifetime. And to, to receive that much acreage, we have like 157 acres, it would, it's impossible because there weren't seeds left, there were no pine cones left. So we have to get the seedlings from somewhere else. And nobody's got that. Many. They burn a million acres in New Mexico. To see. There aren't enough seedlings. It's going to change the landscape, but we've accepted. <laughs> we have no choice. That's what surrender is. You know, we accept it. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Quite a few years ago, I went to the upper sale here in Taos. I've been noticing, you know, all kinds of stuff going on here in New Mexico. And this woman was at this yard sale in a wheelchair, and she had scars all over her leg just related to the main situation. And I asked her what happened, you know, and she said he was best friends with, he was a good friend of the woman who ran the Navajo Weaving Project out there in the Navajo Reservation. And they, her friend that ran the Weaving Project was getting on the radio quite a bit out there and trying to educate people about uh, uranium that was being buried illegally on the, on the Navajo Reservation. And they were traveling on that long highway from Cuba, goes across the reservation at high speed in their car because you know there's no traffic. And her friend who ran the Navajo Weaving Project screamed and said, I can't steer the car. And the car just steered right off the road, started flipping, and they both ended up in the fence. Her legs were totally shredded, and her friend that ran the Navajo Weaving Project was killed. And so this woman that I met that told me the story told me that she went to try to find the car at the junkyard and they, they got rid of the car so she could never get the car to examine to see if there was a motor that turned the wheel off the road. And she was convinced that they were, you know, that they were part of it. One other thing I wanted to say is I've done a lot of research on fires and how they're put out. In 1933, the head of the Forest Service in the United States, his name was Ferdinand Silcox. He had a rule just before aircraft in 1933 that fires were to be put out by 10 o'clock the next morning after they started. It was called the 10 o'clock rule. So they had it down in 1933. And I've been noticing that growing up here in New Mexico, they're not doing anything without these fires in the first week. In the first three days, when you can put them out, they wait until they get huge. And then they bring in, they, the media gets involved and they bring in all these aircraft and make a big stink about it and burn the hell out of everything. They could put these fires out on the first or second day. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to thank both of you so much for. Um, your illuminating discussion, and I uh, have um, put on the Environmental Film Festival here in Taos, and I have shown the um, uranium mining, and as I uh, remember correctly, about a third of the Navajo Nation cannot drink the water, and I I am really grateful that the, um, the museum of um, contemporary art of Native American in Santa Fe put on that epic show this last year. And I, I'm feeling a little bit hopeful, but um, uh, we can't leave the discussion without uh, mentioning Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is making plutonium hit for nuclear bombs that we don't need right now as we speak. And, um, and, and we are down lingers here in Taos, so um, Rocky Flats, those who were acquainted in Colorado, 
they had an exhibition at the library that I happened to stumble into back in 2018. And um, they had some analysis of, of criticality. And so it's just really overwhelming with width and the waste isolation. And that's kind of what I focused into. And then also I grew up in Los Angeles. My grandmother took a covered wagon moved down to Redondo Beach and I studied with Gilbert, um, Lujan, Michael, uh, Judy Baca. Mm -hmm. And so my roots go back in, into Mexico on my dad's side. And so I appreciate it. I remember when you lived here and, um, and then you left. So I, I just want to thank you all for the Thank you. I was a top senator for 12 years. <laughs> it took me 12 years to get that title. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, everyone. And thank you, Paula and Will, for your insights today. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.